Okay, so welcome everyone to part one of the inequity of COVID-19. This is focused on the impact of women and minorities in the workplace. Um, so before we start, I wanna take a brief minute to recognize our partner companies for their continued support of OWL, which enables us to bring programs like we have today to you guys. Um, our sincere thanks to Airy, Allergan and Abvi Company, Alcon, Horizon Therapeutics, Johnson & Johnson Vision, Novartis, Star Surgical, and Zeiss. We appreciate all of your support in our mission to advance diversity and leadership within ophthalmology. So today for the program today, um, we're going to have our featured guest speaker, Claylin Ellengrad, go ahead and give us um, a keynote talk about minorities and women in the workplace and how they've been impacted by COVID-19. Um, and after that, Cleland has graciously um, agreed to take questions from everyone. So if you wanna use your chat window over to the right, to send us questions or comments throughout the talk. We'll go through those and try and address as many as we can before the end of this. Um, and wanted to remind you guys also that today's session will be recorded. So you can access this after on our website through the membership login. And um, we also have part two coming next week. So register for that if you haven't. And Clayla will be joining us there as well with a panel of um, ophthalmic peers, which we'll be announcing soon um, to discuss kind of what comes next. So today we're gonna focus on um, the impact and, and what's going on today uh, within ophthalmology. So um, at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Quaylen, um, our featured speaker, so that we can go ahead and get started. Uh, Quaylen Ellingrid is a senior partner and leads McKenzie's life insurance and annuities practice in North America. She is a leader in the North American operations practice and was the first woman to lead the Minneapolis location. Over the past 15 years at McKenzie, Quaylen has led multiple global transformations, integrating both operations and strategy to empower employees, better deliver for customers, and improve efficiency and effectiveness. She was selected as a member of McKinsey's Global Institute Council, where she has led numerous research efforts, including on the impact of COVID-19 on jobs and gender equality globally. This is kind of how we came across Quaylen and have been very impressed with all of her research and insights that she's led to this topic for us. She's a co-author on a paper titled COVID-19 and Jobs, Monitoring the U.S. Impact on People and Places, which examines the impact of the pandemic on U.S. jobs by income, race, education, geography, and she is the instigator and co-author of multiple reports on how to close the global gender gap, including power of parity, how, do, how advancing women's equality can add 12 trillion to global growth. Quaylen has an MBA from Harvard Business School and a BA in economics and political science, also from Harvard. Uh, she lives in Minnesota with her husband and her three daughters, an eight-year-old and five-year-old twins. So now I'll pass it over to you, Quaylen, and you can share some of your research and insights on our topic today. Wonderful. Thank you, Kristen, and thank you for being here with us today. I wanted to first start by talking about what does the talent pipeline look like across um, the Fortune 1000 set of industries? What does that look like by gender? What does that look like by race? Uh, and then specifically, what has the impact of COVID-19 been on that talent pipeline? So here is where we start. And if you look at the third row from the bottom, that 2020 row, the talent pipeline at the entry level starts off at 47% women, almost half. Then it drops by nine percentage points down to 38% at that manager level, that first promotion to manager. Then by about five or so percentage points at every single level down to about 21%, one in five of the C-suite. So one in five people reporting to the CEO across Fortune 1000 companies in the United States are women. But even that belies a bit of the balance of power in the typical C-suite, because a woman is much more likely to be the head of HR, chief legal counsel, CIO, even CFO, versus run the biggest PL or the second biggest PL. And when we look at CEOs of Fortune 500 companies that are promoted from within, every single year between 99 and 100% of them are promoted from running the biggest PL or the second biggest PL to the CEO role. Almost never do they promote the head of HR, or chief legal counsel to be that CEO. So if we want to shift what used to be 5%, then 6%, now I think we're around 7% of Fortune 500 CEOs who are women uh, and increase that dramatically, we need to shift the mix between staff roles and line roles in that C-suite. And if you look at the other end where we started at that 47% uh, in 2020 of the entry-level workers being women, 
even that is a lot lower than what the college graduation rate is in the United States. So 56% of college degrees right now today go to women in the US. And it's been that way for a while. Uh, that's pretty consistent across other developed countries as well in that range. And so already between the 56% of college degrees that go to women, right, women getting higher average GPAs or the majority of valedictorians are outperforming academically men, there's already drop off between that 56% down to the 47%. So if Fortune 1000 companies were getting their fair share of college graduated talent, that number would already be quite different. And if you look down at the bottom two rows, what you'll see is the history of progress we've made over the last five or so years since we started this uh, in what is the Women in the Workplace benchmark, which is the broadest and deepest benchmarking of its kind in partnership with Lean In. It covers over 300 different companies uh, and a collection of over 12 million employees across the US. What you see across the bottom row is that over the last five years, we've made barely any progress at all at the entry level, first few levels, manager, all the way up, frankly, to VP, right? This is where the bulk of women and people of color are across organizations. We have made progress in more of the 20% range of improvement at the SVP level and the C-suite level. So direct reports to the CEO. That's where one different hire, right? One woman hired instead of a man can swing it 10% this direction, 10% the other direction. That's a 20% swing in a 10-person you know, leadership team, as an example. So those numbers have improved a bit over the last five years, um, but quite a ways to go. And every year between zero and 1% improvement across the rest of the talent pipeline. Let's also though look at women of color. And women of color in this survey is Black, Latina, and Asian women all added together. Uh, we are looking into getting more Native American data, um, but the observation and sample sizes is, is too small to get that granularity quite yet. Uh, there is some LGBTQ granularity as well in different cuts. But here, women of color is Black, Latina, and Asian women all added together. And they start off at about 18% of the entry level funnel, around the same rate as men uh, of color but then they drop really dramatically down to 3% of the C-suite. So literally one out of 35 people reporting to the CEO are either a black, Latina, or Asian woman all added together. And that's just one fourth of the level of men of color at that level. So keep in mind, this is the broader backdrop. This is the landscape or the talent landscape pre-COVID. Now, what has COVID done to this talent pipeline that was already had some pinch points, had some leakiness. Um, as one example, before we go into the impact of COVID, that nine percentage point drop at the entry level, right from 47% down to 38%. That pinch point at that first promotion to manager is what we call the broken rung. And that broken rung of promotions means that for every men, 100 men who are promoted in the US across these Fortune 1000 companies, only 85 women are promoted and only 58 black women are promoted. And that gap in promotion levels, if I add that up over five years across these industries, is the equivalent of one million missing women in leadership positions. And what we find now at the other end of five years here, one million missing women in leadership, another five years there, another five years there, this building on itself over time as this leaky funnel of promotion rates to manager kind of works its way through the funnel, We've got millions of missing women now in leadership positions and therefore a very unequal funnel in the middle and certainly at the senior levels of that. If you flip to the next page, what has COVID done to this talent pipeline? Um, there have been some benefits, some silver linings, if you will. For example, uh, flexibility was the number one thing that both women and men wanted from their employers pre-COVID. And we got that in spades as we had the largest global work from home experiment ever. Um, but it's also a challenge, right? One in four women have been uh, considering leaving the workforce or downshifting their careers. Uh, that would mean around 2 million or more potential women who could exit the workforce. And that would erase all of the progress we've seen over the last five to six years since we started this broader benchmarking. And so how do we stem some of the impact that we've seen um, across groups of both women and people of color? Let's talk a little bit more about some of that impact um, on the next page. Three groups in our Women in the Workplace research have been disproportionately affected by COVID. Mothers, especially mothers of young children, Black women, 
and senior level women. So mothers of young children, over 40% of mothers of young children added 15 hours or more to their weekly schedule during the pandemic. You know, three hours a day, 15 hours a week, that is a very healthy part-time job. That's compared to 27% of fathers. So 40% of mothers, 27% of fathers. As a result, one in four mothers are worried that their performance is being negatively judged at work because of their other responsibilities. There's also a lot more time spent cooking, cleaning, as we're cooking at home much more than we ever did before. And that challenge has been significant. Keep in mind that this is already off a very unequal base. So in the United States, women do on average about double the amount of unpaid care work as men. Unpaid care work is shopping, cooking, cleaning, taking care of kids, taking care of parents, in-laws, all of that stuff that you would not do in the formal workforce, but do not for pay. Uh, about 80% of that historically was the shopping, cooking, cleaning part. About 15% of that historically was taking care of kids. And I think the taking care of kids and the cooking has increased dramatically during COVID. Uh, mothers of young children have been significantly affected, especially in September when schools were going back into session, many of them remotely and online. Uh, in September, 1.1 million people in the US stepped out of the workforce or were fired. 80% of them were women, right? Just as school was going back online and you had one, two, in my case, three kids going back to virtual school, um, that was a real challenge and disproportionately affected mothers. Uh, we know that when women step out of the workforce, their unemployment is stickier. They tend to stay out of the workforce for longer and it's harder for them to find a job on the way back. And so hopefully as we rebound and slowly build the jobs post COVID, that re-entry is a little bit smoother than it has been historically. Black women were also disproportionately affected and 52% of black women are the only black women on their teams. They are 1.6 times more likely to hear demeaning remarks about people like them or hear surprise at their verbal or other abilities. At the same time, we have the coming together of disparities, racial disparities in the workplace with health disparities in our broader health system. And black women are two and a half times more likely, almost three times more likely than their white female peers to have lost a loved one during COVID. At the same time, they're one and a half times less likely to feel comfortable sharing that, sharing their full authentic selves and sharing that experience at work. So a lot of different challenges resulting in black women and black men, but particularly black women, uh, thinking about downshifting or exiting the workforce altogether. Senior level women were the third group that were disproportionately affected. And this surprised me a little bit, um, but since COVID they have felt disproportionate pressure to work longer hours. Uh, almost 50% of them feeling pressure to be always on and over 50% of them feeling constantly exhausted. Uh, we know that senior women tend to take on more visible and proactive sponsorship and mentorship roles in the organization. They're much more likely to be proactive mentors and sponsors to other leaders, diverse leaders in the organization. And so as we're feeling this group particularly hit um, or particularly affected by COVID, that would be a disproportionate loss for mentorship and sponsorship efforts. So keep in mind that those three groups are disproportionately affected uh, by COVID. And then as we look ahead, if you flip to the next page, what will this look like, not just during COVID in this year, but as we look ahead to the economic recovery? And here what you see is a bit of the mapping of when will we get back to pre-COVID level jobs? Uh, so not when will we get back to equality or when will we close the gap between men and women in the workplace? No, when will we regain the ground that we lost over the course of this last year and get back to pre-COVID levels of inequality? And what you see is that men, broadly the economy overall, regains jobs in about 2023. This is by the way, later than GDP, right? We, will, we recover GDP faster than we recover jobs. You'll hear a lot of times econo economists talk about a jobless recovery. And if you look back to 2008, 2001, in these recessions, every time it took the US economy longer and longer to rebuild those jobs. And I think this time around, 2021, 2022, with accelerating automation and COVID, in many cases, those two factors affecting the very same occupations, the very same workers, it will take even longer. And this page shows you that disproportionate impact. So if overall we're rebuilding or regaining the jobs in around 2023, 
women will take about 18 months longer to regain those jobs to get back to pre-COVID levels of jobs. Um, by race, it differ, it's, it's roughly the same in a mix across groups, um, Asians a little bit earlier, although there's a lot of disparity within this broader group of Asian um, demographics. Education and income are probably the most stark, and these are highly correlated in our economies as well as others. If you have less than a high school degree, or if you have less than 25,000 or 35,000 in income, you're not gonna recover till about 2025 in terms of pre-COVID levels of jobs versus 2023 for the rest of the economy, and even earlier for those who are earning higher incomes or have a master's or above degree. So you see the disparities, not only during COVID has COVID impacted jobs-wise, those who can least afford it and the more diverse people disproportionately in our workplace. But as we think about the recovery, the jobs recovery, the recovery will be quite a bit slower between 18 months or two, three years for women uh, and those with less than a high school degree and those with lower wage jobs. If you flip to the next page, so what can we do about it? Um, there's a number of things that I think companies can do as well as individuals you and I can each do in our day to day. I think companies can look really hard at what elements of their job, their workplace can they make more sustainable and flexible, not just for women, but for men as well. They can work to minimize unconscious bias and I would con connect this to taking a closer look at performance reviews. Um, there's a lot of evidence that unconscious bias, not just on the recruiting side, but also on the retention and promotion side uh, is at play. So for example, I can give all of you exactly identical resumes down to the font size, the font type, the exact bullet points that I write. And all I change is the name at the top, John Doe versus Jane Doe. And men, and the kicker is women also, will ascribe greater leadership and higher potential to this imaginary John Doe resume, right? It's the exact same resume, these people don't even exist, but we think of and imagine this John Doe as having higher leadership and higher potential. Now, should Jane Doe put again on that exactly identical resume, active PTA member or any other signal, parent teacher association or any other active signal that she is a very active involved parent, I think it's something like 89% less likely to get the job. Same thing by race. John Doe versus Jamal Doe, or another African-American name. That is 50% less likely to get called in for the interview and it worth a, an experience gap of eight years, an eight year penalty for the black candidate. John Doe versus Mohammed Doe, same thing, four times less likely to get called in for an interview. And this is an environment where we say, we want diversity, where are the talented diverse candidates? And I would say oftentimes they're staring us right in the face, sometimes with exactly identical resumes and we can't see it for our own conscious and unconscious bias. So how do we work that out of the system at the front end as well as throughout performance reviews? And then strengthening employee communication to be more transparent, more open, more accommodating of different needs. I would say particularly during this time, there's been a huge increase in mental health needs uh, and broader flexibility care needs um, and flexibility there. And then individually, I think each of us can be much more proactive in broadening our sponsorship network, right? Who are the two people that you sponsor and help who don't look like you? And who doesn't look like you will be different than who doesn't look like me, but how do we consciously proactively expand that network and encourage others to do the same? I know some leadership teams actually literally list on their reviews, who are you sponsoring who doesn't look like you? And how will I track their success and performance and, and sort of pathway to know that you're reaching out and helping. And then I would also say ask for and give tough and direct feedback. What we see is that both for women and for people of color, uh, we receive feedback, tough feedback in particular, less frequently than our white male peers. And often that's because um, the givers of the feedback don't want to appear mean or they're afraid of an emotional reaction. In other words, they're afraid of tears. But you compound that over a career. And if I'm not hearing the feedback of, Quaylen, here's what you need to learn to run the business, or here's what you need to do to advance to the next level, then I'm not gonna get the chance to grow at the same rate. So make sure that you're both asking for that feedback and delivering that feedback on your team. And with that, I know we wanted to save plenty of time for both reflections, questions, discussion. Uh, so would open it up to the group. Thank you so much, Quaylen. This is 
This is incredible data. Um, so pleased that you brought it to us. Um, as a reminder, the chat window is over to the right. So feel free to go ahead and leave some comments, questions, and then go ahead and get us started with a few, if you don't mind, Kaylin. Um, you know, in one of your early slides <clears throat> with the, the rungs and the groups of people and the different levels of workforce, um, you showed that the percentage of women, specifically women of color, decreasing as they move along. And, and you mentioned this is this is prior to COVID. So, you know, what does that look like now in, in what you've seen? And, and what does that look like five to 10 years from now if we're not changing anything? Yeah, um, it's not a pretty picture, right? I, I think it's been um, women of color have been disproportionately affected. And so I would expect either zero or negative progress at some of those levels um, during COVID. I think there's something like almost half a million more women who have stepped out of the workforce in the US alone um, over the first kind of nine months of COVID. And so getting those women back into the workforce and progressing at those same levels will be critical, um, but it's not, it's not a pretty picture. And, and the percentage rate of improvement every single year is not good, right? It's literally, pretty much 0% every year. In a good year, we improve by about 1% um, in terms of overall women of color. So that would be Black, Latina, and Asian all added together. And you know, one of the reasons, there's a number of reasons why in drivers, we've talked a bit about unconscious bias. You know, Some of the other things are more subtle in day-to-day, -day, um, but what we call sort of the small paper cuts, microaggressions, right? The paper cuts that you get at work. So when you saw me, did you mistake me for somebody much more junior than I am? Or did you um, give credit for my ideas to somebody else in the organization? And there's a range of different microaggressions that people in general experience in the workplace. And what we see in this data is men also experience microaggressions, but more in the sort of single digit level. White women experience them quite a bit more than all men on average. And then women of color and LGBTQ, but especially black women experience microaggressions the most. So, you know, two out of five black women hearing surprise at other people's surprise at their verbal abilities, for example, or hearing demeaning remarks about people like them. Interestingly, um, about two thirds of Asian women having their ideas um, appropriated to somebody else or other people getting credit for their ideas, for example. So a lot of challenges there, and even in the day-to-day -day small things of microaggressions. So, you know, this kind of leads me to the other conversation about, you know, education levels and how this is affecting the, those of us who are in, you know, lower levels of employment in a greater disparity than those in higher levels. You know, and I'm looking at it five to 10 years from now, if we're losing women, if we're losing people of color in those lower levels, our leadership five to 10 years from now, you know, to your point, maybe instead of growth, in those communities, maybe we're, we're shrinking down quite a bit. We're losing that sponsorship. We're losing those lower levels of diversity in our workforce. And, and that's concerning. Um, and, and a lot of why we're having this conversation today, because, you know, I think, I think we're all vested and I know all of our attendees, all of our members are vested in, in trying to continue having this conversation and to try and bring this to the forefront. Um, so, you know, on that same note, we talk about, long-term earnings potential for women. We talk about stickier unemployment rates. Um, you know, what can we do down the road to help those who have left the workforce re-enter and kind of jump back in? Um, I know a lot of companies have had to make tough decisions. A lot of families have had to make tough decisions. So, you know, let's look past that. You know, how do we recover from this and, and try and keep moving forward? Yeah. Well, I think one of the biggest challenges is that women have the majority of part-time jobs around the world and the minority of full-time jobs. And when you do have a challenge like the pandemic, usually in layoff um, or furloughs, you would affect your part-time workers first. And so there's a disproportionate mix there. Uh, I do think one of the things that companies can do is number one, stay in touch. Uh, even if you were a full-time or a part-time worker uh, and you were a diverse worker of some sort, how do we stay in touch so that over time, potentially you don't have to be retrained. Um, we could reinstate, especially if, if business starts to pick back up. Uh, I think re-entry uh, or on-ramp programs have been really helpful. So for example, even if you're just coming back from a maternity leave or another approved health leave, how do we make that re-entry as seamless as possible? So mentorship programs, support, 
um, making sure that you could be in town and not travel if needed. All of those elements, I think, help with retention at critical points. Uh, and what we've seen, it differs kind of industry by industry and company by company. But oftentimes, uh, attrition rates for women right around having a kid and coming back from an approved leave are quite, quite high. And so how do you reduce some of those pretty big points of leakage uh, to retain not just women, but other diverse leaders? And interestingly, when some companies have increased their paternity leave, it's actually improved retention rates for both men and women. So everybody getting better at how do we do on ramps and off ramps for men? And knowing that I could do that for a male colleague just as much as a female colleague gets the muscles built so that we're just better and more seamless at these on ramps for everybody. Um, so I didn't think that paternity leave extensions would help women, but they actually have quite a bit in the workplace. Yeah, that, that's a bit of conversation that we've had at our own at our own firm. So I. I... I fully agree with that. Um, we've got some great questions over here. So let me kind of dip over. Um, Heather's asking, you know, how do you think we can keep this topic of bias at the forefront of dialogue within our workplace and our industry at large? Yeah, a couple ideas. And I think there's a ra broad range of companies from those that do the, you know, let's do two hours of classroom training and then we'll call it done. We've, you know, checked the box on unconscious bias training to the other end of the spectrum that say, that's clearly not enough. How do we really work this into our people systems? And how do we make sure that in HR, in succession planning, in all of our talent reviews, this is worked in? So for example, I led our Minneapolis office for many years, which means I, I lead our people reviews. And in those conversations, we would have an unconscious bias observer. And we would all be trained on the most common biases that would could happen in our environment a couple of keywords that would tell us when that bias might be happening. And then it was that person's job, the unconscious bias observer to ask the tough questions. Like, would we have had the same conversation if this weren't a woman coming back from maternity leave? Or would we have had the same conversation if this weren't a very aggressive man in the same successful style as his mentor? And those are the conversations that need to take place in the room. But importantly, it trains you to think differently outside the room. When we're having the feedback calls, it's much more common, for example, for us now to say, oh, I can hear myself, that might be biased, but let's explore if there's something deeper there. So I'm trained to say, well, what was the actual impact on the client or on the situation? I hear that you felt like she had a quieter leadership style. What was the impact? Let's talk about that versus your perception of what may be a very narrow male dominated leadership style. Um, and we're able to dig underneath and, and get under that. So I would say, how you keep it forefront for management teams is working it into succession planning, uh, making sure you have unconscious bias observers that you're deeply trained on seeing this and having the honest, open conversation. Um, and one thing that I've seen a number of companies do just to kind of flip it around is to mandate diverse slates as ex an example, to move the needle, especially in VP level and above hiring. When you shift from either nothing mandated on the slate to either, you know, maybe one, you know, the Rooney rule of one diverse candidate on the slate. Importantly, when you shift to two or more diverse candidates, that's where the real unlock happens, uh, at least typically when we see it. And that's where you get kind of three to four times the hiring rate of the diverse candidate. So Xerox, as an example, a number of years ago said, for VP level openings and above, we're going to keep those openings open until you have one woman and one woman of color on the slate. And when you've got that and get creative, we're happy to help you source and identify potential candidates, then we can start interviewing. Otherwise, I think especially at more senior levels, you get kind of pockets of hiring. And when you're just hiring one person every couple of years, the inertia and the bias of, oof, I don't, you know, that person's so different than the rest of the group. The inertia towards like, let's just hire people in the same background, profile, potentially style as we've got, because otherwise there may be organ rejection. I think that is an important bias to confront and have the real conversation of we need a diverse slate. We also need diverse interviewers. If we can't have that, then probably going to have a hard time convincing them to accept the offer, even if we get it. Um, but those are a couple of ways, I think, to kind of keep it forefront for organization. That's, that's amazing. Um, and Aaron asked a really great question and said, you know, sometimes it's challenging to bring up this conversation as women, as people of color, as LGBTQT, um, you know, 
as if it, it almost comes across sometimes as if we're complaining or we're there's like you said an emotional response to it um you know do you have any advice there i i have i have one technique that i that i use a lot and that's just simply asking the question of you know what do you mean by that um if you hear somebody say something that strikes you off off key you know maybe maybe it's against you maybe it's a microaggression against somebody else but just saying you know hey what did you mean by that and giving them the opportunity to reflect um and maybe rephrase because perhaps it's just a communication issue um, and perhaps it comes from you know a place that they need to do some reflection but it, it takes the sting out of it for me um, and it comes from a place of wanting to be colleagues and grow together so that's that's my one tip um what do you have Graylin? yeah i like that one what did you mean by that i think also uh um would you have said the same thing or thought the same thing if that were a white man or you know a woman of color or just kind of for yourself or others testing uh the boundaries and kind of trying on different ideas to really explore as you were describing and then i think you really do need that psychological safety to feel comfortable exploring that and having the honest conversation about it um, I do think uh, role plays and kind of examples of like, let's talk about this as a group. How would we ta tackle this particular type of bias when you feel like it's happening or you see it and you don't know how to confront it? I think that can be quite helpful. And I would expand, it's not just by gender and race, it's also by different types of backgrounds, ability, right? Introvert, extrovert, different styles. I mean, we have a very narrow view typically of what is acceptable and kind of thought of as leadership. And the more we expand that, I think that's better for everybody. Um, so those are a couple of things. Um, but I think mostly it's creating a common language where we can all talk about it and kind of raise your hand and say, let's just explore this a little bit together. I'm feeling a little uncomfortable. Or did you think that that could have been? Or what did you mean by that? I think are all great ways to, to have the conversation. And then more broadly, when we're thinking about kind of broader group objectives or maybe organizational objectives, I found that anchoring this in business outcomes in your customers can often be helpful. So at McKinsey, for example, we would say, well, wouldn't we want to at least mirror the diversity levels at senior levels of our clients? Otherwise, I mean, how embarrassing to walk into a room and say, you know, here's our advice or here's our thoughts, if you can't at least match their level of diversity. Um, we also know that, for example, diverse teams are better. They, they just frankly solve tough problems better. So for instance, if you want to solve a problem quickly and easily, uh, you should put a homogeneous team that has kind of grown up in the same environment, right? All has the same assumptions. They will just intuitively know how to work together. They will get to a quick answer. But if you've got a problem that hasn't been solved before, you want a team that comes from different perspectives, questions each other's assumptions, pushes each other. They will, it's been studied quite a bit and written up in HBR and elsewhere, diverse teams solve tough problems better, number one. Number two, and I think actually even more valuable, diverse teams are more open to the idea that they didn't get the best answer the first time around. So this notion, which is so critical to me, of continuous improvement. How do we get a little bit better every single day diverse teams are more likely to do that. And so because we want, of course, diverse teams to reflect our customers and, and think more creatively and innovate better, um, for all those reasons, diverse teams are important. And then using that as part of the rationale of how do we get there and how do we retain the talent that's gonna keep us at the cutting edge. Oh yeah, that's that's fantastic. I know in, in an ophthalmology, our patient population is incredibly diverse and in fact skews more towards that minority um, population. So I think it's, you know, it's just another reason why it's so important for us to kind of continue to reflect that patient population so that we can address them with our technologies, with our services better. Um, let's see, Dr. Bavel asks, you know, how do you show the benefit of diversity? You know, oftentimes, to your point, you were talking about how diverse rooms, you know, diverse teams are giving us better solutions, but, you know, oftentimes they're perceived as being, you know, in the room to fulfill a quota. Uh, and, and how do we get beyond that? To a point where you know in the doctor's practice or you know in a boardroom or in a in an r d team how can we show that that benefit that's a very tangible benefit to leadership to make this a priority yeah i think uh, the tone from the top matters and how a ceo or other leader describes that as this is part of how we're going to stay innovative um, how our team is going to operate better i think that really matters grounding it in a business reason versus like, this is just a nice thing to do and we wanna kind of do it on the side. I think that is critical because if it's viewed as a nice to have, 
in a pandemic or in any other crunch, it's just gonna go out the window. If this is a business critical reason, that's a very different thing. You know, half of companies that we've studied globally actually don't make any real progress over kind of a five, 10 year time frame on either gender diversity or racial diversity. They just kind of tread water and try to replace the diversity that they had originally. Then there's a number of companies, there's about 15% of companies that are both starting from a pretty good spot of gender diversity and they make significant progress. 15% of companies or so, and then 35% of companies start from a pretty good spot of ethnic diversity or racial diversity and also make improvement. So the question is, how do you as a leadership team set the tone to be in that top 15 to 35% of companies? And I think you need to make a real business case grounded in your customers, grounded in the payoff. I'll give you one example, um, probably one of my favorite companies that's kind of really tied, um, put their money where their mouth is, if you will, is Sodexo. And Sodexo runs the cafeterias of many large hospitals, schools, large organizations. And Sodexo was finding that at the entry level, they had majority women, in fact, 52% women at the, at the entry level. But they had, similar to the pipeline that you saw, a lot of drop off to that first promotion to manager. And then of course, beyond that. And the CEO of Sodexo looked across their business units and said, look, I know, and I see this broader business case, but what I care about is Sodexo and our business units and our results. And they found when they did the regressions that business units with 42% or more diverse leadership, not just women, but racially diverse, military experience, et cetera, did better in a downturn. They had higher profitability and they had higher growth rates. And so he said 15% of your senior leadership comp is tied to getting to 42% or more diverse leadership. Tell me what you need. I will make the calls. I will do whatever you need me to do but 15% of your comp is there, go. And you can imagine when you're that clear about what you need and you, you tell me how I can help you, um, the numbers move a heck of a lot faster than they do when we just kind of talk about it and set an aspirational goal. Yeah, so putting your money where your mouth is there, um, really making it a priority from leadership on down. I think that's you know really important and definitely something I think you know, we can do better. Um, you know, let's, let's take a step back here. You know, we talked about people leaving the work workforce, but let's talk about burnout. <clears throat> let's talk about the people who haven't left the workforce, but are still working. You know, maybe we're working with fewer resources. So we're working harder, we're working longer hours. And, um, you know, there's a lot of, I know there's a lot of stress for people running practices, trying to get patients and dealing with changing guidelines. Um, dealing with employees who can't work as much. And, and you know, at the end of the day, we, we have business goals that we're all trying to meet. So, you know, those don't change as much as, you know, there may be some flexibility, they're still there. So, you know, how do we address that burnout? Um, you know, how do we support our teams as leaders to kind of make them feel like, you know, we're in this together, we can take some of that stress off perhaps, you know, what, what can we do to spot that and address burnout in our teams? Yeah. I think part of the silver lining in all of this is that we've be all become much more open to sharing what is outside of work with our work colleagues that so you can't avoid it, right? You're in each other's homes and seeing each other's pets and children as they wander by. Um, so I think using that opportunity to have a broader conversation about, no, how are you as a person before I get to the job and the performance and the results? Um, I think that can be really powerful and, and critical. We have seen, by the way, just a huge increase in mental health needs during this time. Companies that had a mental health hotline have seen anywhere from 300 to 500% increases in calls to that hotline. Part of that is greater awareness, but a lot of that is just greater stress, right? With all of this unprecedented challenges and, and pressures that we feel. So I think opening the conversation individually at a team, addressing the person first before getting to the rest of the work, uh, I think can be really important. Yeah, I was, um, I was talking with a colleague and they were talking about a hospital that had set up a, a mental health um, kind of clinic or work line for their physicians, thinking that everybody was going to be calling in about you know, the impact of COVID and how it was stressful to do their jobs. And they found that overwhelmingly the doctors were calling in stressed about how they manage home life and how they, how they balance all of these things. I think women across the board were so precariously balanced um, prior to COVID. You know, I, I, one of our wonderful physicians, Dr. Liz Yu gave a keynote for OWL many moons ago, and she joked about how 
you know, people ask her all the time how she balances her life. And she says, there's no such thing as balance. It's a seesaw. You know, you may catch me at a good moment, but, you know, in reality, we're all just trying to not let anything hit the ground. Um, and I think COVID really, really hit that. And for all of us who were, you know, juggling things already, I think it became just even more difficult. Um, but I know that, you know, we also talked about the bright spots of everything that we've done, right? So the flexibility, the working from home. Um, you talked about how that was a benefit of this pandemic. So how can we pinpoint the things that are working for us now? And how do we keep those and integrate those into how we're doing business now to kind of continue to make that transition easier <laughs> as it can be? Yeah. I would say a couple of benefits. One is greater flexibility to integrate work and home um, and work from home should you need to. I think that's a huge benefit. I, I know a lot of people have cut down on commuting time, on travel time, right? That's been a huge um, sort of boost to the, the weekly schedule. I also think there's been a real democratization, little d, in meetings and interactions, right? Everybody is a square on your screen, as opposed to the CEO sitting at the head of the table. Maybe you have a seat at the table, maybe you don't. Everybody is the same square and the ability to both either participate or add comments in chat if you don't feel comfortable. That has really, I think, opened up a lot of participation, I think in great ways. Now, how we keep some of that equality when we go back, and I think the concern for me is, as some workplaces open up and you can't mandate, typically vaccination, you can't mandate coming back yet. Um, I think the people who will choose to come back are usually men on average, usually people without childcare responsibilities. And if that means that more women, more women with children in particular, stay home to balance the odd thing here or there, and they're not as visible in the workplace, or they're not as visible in meetings, and there's a little bit of this second class citizen, I'm on Zoom and there's a half the meeting is in the room and I'm trying to jump in, but I can't. And I'm just not visible in the cafeteria and around on, you know, in the workplace. I think it will be gradual, but I think that will be a real disadvantage in the medium and long term for career progression and just kind of awareness and connectivity. Um, we also know historically women tend to be over mentored, but under sponsored. And that's a real challenge uh, that would be exacerbated by coming back to work. So I think there has been real silver linings, but some watch out areas as we go forward. I also think more broadly, if we kind of zoom out from individual workplaces and, and sort of employers, the media has also moved women's issues, women in the workplace, care, and that intersection to be a front page issue, right? It is kind of top of mind for a lot more people than it was before. And so thinking about care, not as like my personal thing that I need to figure out and juggle, but could care be an infrastructure item across, you know, at the federal level, at the state level, do employers start to get much more involved in supporting care financially than they were before? I think those are some of the hopefully silver lining shifts that we'll start to see. Yeah, we, we joke because we have a conference room that has not been used in a year. So we joke about just throwing everybody's children in it. And uh, so we can all work, pretty sure it violates some, uh, some codes, but you know. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we've done on our office, we're a very small company, um, but we had to pivot very quickly, like everybody did. And I think we took for granted those spontaneous conversations that you mentioned, the being able to walk out to the, to the water cooler, so to speak, and, and talk about the status of a project or talk about some ideas and that, that kind of intrinsic value that's there. Um, so one of the things we really um, looked for was a way to, way to supplement that in um, virtual teams. So we have started using Slack. I know some companies use Microsoft Teams, but um, and the other goal there was to be able to see when people were online and when they weren't so that we could start kind of going back to having the end of a workday. Um, you know, this is something that I've seen a lot of is just that scope creep or that those work hours creeping on because we are working from home because we have that flexibility, um, you know, kind of eroding that work life balance again so um, I think that's important too, and something we can do on the business side is, is to try and respect those boundaries and try to allow people to have that time where they're off. Um, because for me, I know I'm way more, I'm way better at, career, at uh, creativity, problem solving, all of those things when I've had, would have had some downtime. <laughs> Um, so I think you brought up two groups of people that I thought were really interesting here. And one of those was senior women. 
and how this is impacting senior women, which, you know, I know is a surprise to you. It's a bit of a surprise to me. And a lot of that probably has to do with my own bias of, of the, the struggles that I deal with. And um, how do we, how do we support that group? How do we identify and support the, the struggles that, that, that are affecting that group and kind of continue them along the path? Yeah, I think part of it is awareness, being aware that they are often asked to lead people initiatives, all of these other, what we would often call housework or office work, um, and more often spend time on those things in addition to delivering on the business and the other objectives. Um, so I think one, awareness, and then two, helping support them uh, in, in what they need, whether that is maybe a little less intensity uh, for a period of time while they also juggle their personal and household challenges, um, or maybe a shift. I, I do think oftentimes we have, women will often shift into more of a staff role. We saw some of those numbers as they shift over time. They might shift into a rotation in HR. I think importantly, getting them back out into the product line or into the business line or into the sort of customer facing p &L roles after that is critical so that it's not just a one-way street or a one-way shift, um, but more of a period of time kind of approach. So like you said, going back to kind of keeping tabs on people and keeping them in that pipeline and keeping that line of communication open so that we can, you know, redirect them in the direction that they want to be for their career and that, you know, works for the company. Um, so there's a couple other things that we talked about, um, unconscious bias. Uh, what can we do? You know, what, okay. So first off, specifically, you, you mentioned a few things of unconscious bias, uh, name recognition or key terms on a resume, like PTA president or something along those lines. What other forms of unconscious bias do you see specifically and, and how can we kind of be self-aware of that and address it proactively so that we can avoid it? Because I think you brought up a really good point is this isn't something that men do to women. This is something that we all do to women, that we all do to minorities, that we all do to people who just don't sound or look like us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if I were to do one thing to just be more aware of my own bias, and we're all biased, right, to different extents, to diff on different topics, Absolutely. I would just go online and take the IAT. And IAT is the Implicit Association Test. Um, millions of people have taken it. There's been over 120 studies, like in-depth research studies done on this. And what the IAT results and these research studies will tell you is that, for example, people who have a stronger association with female and family will not hire, given two exactly identical resumes, they will be much more likely, 87% of them, I think, will hire the man in that situation because their association is female and family, therefore not man and business. And what the IAT tests you online is how quickly, literally split second differences, can you match female and family, man and business, communal, you know, feminine, whatever it is, or black and dangerous, white and happy. And you think, oh, of course, I, I'm not that biased, right? I, I think of myself as a pretty open person, but these split second differences have proven consistent over time. So I think just being aware of all the dimensions of your own bias can be really helpful. And then that plays out not just in the workforce as you're describing, Kristen, it plays out in so many different places. So another place that we didn't describe on resumes, uh, when you, what we call, unfortunately, whiten resumes, when I take off the racial specific, so I'm an Asian American woman, if I were to take off anything that identifies me as such, I will be twice as likely, if not even more, to get called in for an interview, says the data and the research. Same thing for Black resumes. But it goes beyond that. So when you look at orchestras, the top four or five orchestras in the United States, for many, many years, women made up about one out of 20 of professional musicians in orchestras. Then they started to do um, sort of anonymized auditions. First, they put up a curtain so you couldn't see them, but then you could hear the heels walking across the stage. So then they put a curtain, but then you could listen a little bit closer. So then they literally asked everybody to take off their shoes. And as we get progressively deeper into truly anonymized auditions, we see the percentage of women in professional orchestras quadruple, and now it's even higher than that. But that's what it takes to anonymize. The same thing happens, oddly, uh, you know, how we name uh, hurricanes. Hurricanes are named A, B, C, D, alternating female, male. 
apparently people, men, women, everybody, will not take a female hurricane as seriously. So they will not literally evacuate and that has female hurricanes have higher damage. And this is when you control for a whole bunch of different things. So it's so ingrained in kind of societal elements that it applies to not just work, it applies to life. Um, even saving your family for a, from a hurricane. And it starts really young, right? So I've got three daughters, an eight-year-old and twins who are almost six. If I ask any of my three daughters, draw a picture of a genius. Will they draw a man? Will they draw a woman? I don't know, that's six years old, right? But that's when it starts. And then how do you expand how they think about things so that we're not just kind of using the societal blueprint of an Albert Einstein and that's the only thing we know right and we know kind of there's a lot of biases in how history was written as well I think expanding from a very early age and consistently is so important and of course in the workplaces as well yeah that's great um okay so I found another um group of questions and answers for us so we've got a few more minutes to go through this um and I, this one really struck me and it's something that I don't consider again my own bias um you know, and it's the question coming from one of our, our male listeners is, you know, men who feel uncomfortable having these conversations, who feel uncomfortable addressing it, you know, maybe to their male colleagues or to their female colleagues, um, you know, and, and to me, I think there's so much well-meaning actions out there that don't necessarily move us forward. Um, so what can we do to help us be better at having those conversations? What resources are out there so that we can be allies, so that we can address this in a way that isn't going to cause discomfort or, or maybe insult unintentionally? You know, what, what can we do there? Yeah, I think there's two things that can be done. And this is true for a male ally as well as a female ally. Um, number one, you can mentor and sponsor people who don't look like you, and especially women, people of color. Uh, I think that makes a huge difference. For example, we saw two thirds of people say, yep, I'm an ally to women of color. We said, great, 67% of you are allies. Now, who actually sponsors or mentors, much lower bar, who mentors a woman of color? Less than one in 10. How do we translate the good intent exactly to your point, Christian, of two thirds of people saying I'm an ally to actually doing something about it? That could be reaching out, having a coffee chat, right? Or just being open to sharing what your career path has looked like. I think that's critical. And then I think the second thing would be speaking up when you see a microaggression. This could be a small thing, this could be a big thing, but when you are in a meeting and somebody who's maybe a little quieter is not is having a hard time jumping in or somebody gave credit for that idea to somebody else. I, speaking up and saying, oh, I, I think that actually that was Julie's idea. Can we go back to what Katie said? Those are small things, but they matter. They matter in how you share the floor and how you're inclusive to others. And it's not just by gender, not just by race, right? There's many other dimensions of that inclusion that matter there. Those would be the two biggest things I think that both men and women can do to translate that positive intent that I think actually most people have into action, right? That's what makes a difference on the ground. And we've seen for women of color, for black women in particular, when they feel like they have an ally at work, their levels of inclusion, belonging, wanting to stay are just as high as their other female peers. But when they don't, uh, it's, it's just a really challenging situation. They do not feel like they can bring their full and authentic selves to work. Yeah, that's, that's such a great point. And I think when, uh, when, you're, when you're sitting in a room, when you have somebody who's being an ally, an active ally for you in a room, that makes that relationship so much stronger, that opens up that line of communication. And then when we get to a place where we can have those frank conversations where I can get, you know, real and um, frank feedback to your point to where I can improve and we can have those real conversations. I think we all get more comfortable having these conversations. We get more comfortable addressing it in the boardroom. We get more comfortable um, just dealing with it on a day-to-day -day basis and being a true ally. So I, these are great points. Um, so we're kind of reaching the end here. I have one request to provide some um, citation or support to the fact that diverse teams solve complex problems better, which they totally agree with, to be clear. <laughs> but they want to be able, I'm sure, to share it around and yeah. kind of make that point. So um, maybe we can kind of make that resource available to our crew afterwards. Absolutely. Um, and then, you know, I'd say, you know, what's one key takeaway that you really want our audience to kind of stick in their head and, and walk away with today? Yeah. So maybe one note first, it's a Harvard Business Review article around diverse teams, mm. something like diverse teams are smarter or something like that, but it's an HBR article. Okay. 
Okay, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Digs into the the research. You know, I would say I hope you take away from this um, that translating that sponsorship or that positive intent into action, into sponsorship, into new conversations, broadening your own sort of aperture and conversations to other people who don't look like you, I think makes you better, makes you a better leader, more inclusive, um, and can really help somebody, particularly at a time when I think a lot of us could use um, some help. So starting with the people first and um, being inclusive and then translating that into action would be my hope for all of us. Amazing. Gosh, thank you so much for your excellent presentation, Quaylen, and this intense question and answer period. We threw everything at you. Um, so guys, just a reminder, we have part two coming up next week. Quaylen's going to join us there too. We've got some more information about what comes next. Um, we know this is a problem now. We're addressing it. You know, how do we prepare and how do we make things better moving forward? So if we didn't get to your questions today, I'm going to make note of them. We'll bring them up uh, next week so we can address them. And uh, gosh, I appreciate all of the input and all of the activity. It's so great to see you guys engaged. Um, and this will be up for um, this will be up for viewing after this. So if you have somebody on your team that you want to watch this, or if you want to refer to it later, um, it'll be up shortly, so you can attend it there. Um, and you know, gosh, it's, thank you everybody for joining. Thank you, Quaylen. We appreciate you and your time, and we look forward to talking to you again next week. Thank you. Take care.